Hello everyone and thanks for joining us today for the first seminar in our three-part Market Ready India series. Austrade and Wine Australia are running this briefing in partnership and we'd also like to thank the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for their involvement. It is great to see so many of you online. Today we'll look at both the opportunities and the complexities of the alcoholic beverage market in India and take a close look at some aspects of doing business there. But before we begin, let's acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. We acknowledge the lands of the traditional custodians across Australia. We recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's continuing connection to land, water and sky country. We acknowledge the wine regions and hundreds of different nations around this continent and the ancient soils on which we stand and grow. From the Wadani saltwater peoples of the Margaret River in our west to the East Coast Sunrise people of the Yuan Nation and the Southern Island and Saltbush peoples of the Nyoni peoples of Tasmania. Today and always, we pay our deep respects to the custodians, those who went before and those who will follow as the knowledge holders of tomorrow. This is Australia. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we are coming to you from the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay respect to elders past and present. And we extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations. Now, I'm Pro Adams. You might remember me from Landline, the ABC TV program. Um, but before we get into the content for today, I'll step you through a little bit of the housekeeping. At the right of your screen, you will find a chat and a Q&A function. To join the conversation, you can post directly into the chat. To ask a question, simply click on the Add to Q&A button. We'll have three presenters today, one from Wine Australia and two in-market experts, who will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the session, time permitting of course. We'll follow up on any questions that can't be answered during the session. A recording of today's seminar will also be emailed to all attendees. Lastly, if you're having any technical issues, we recommend that you refresh your URL or browser or add a question into the chat. Now, we'd like to begin with a quick poll to gauge interest in this market. You'll see a question pop up on the screen around about now. We'd appreciate it if you could indicate if you are currently exporting to India, if you are considering export in the next five years, or if you are unsure about this market and want to learn more. And then we'll share this result at the end of the seminar. So now before we meet our seminar guests, we will play a short presentation delivered by Australia's High Commissioner to India and Ambassador to Bhutan, the Honourable Barry O'Farrell AO, who will discuss what the new Australia India ECTA means for Australian exporters. Namaskar. I'm delighted to be part of the Market Literacy Initiative by Wine Australia for local producers and exporters on the opportunities and challenges of wine export market in India. Australian-India relations are reaching new heights. We're working closely with India and other partners on a range of regional challenges and to deepen our relationships and commercial links. Across a range of sectors, India is an important economic partner for Australia and we're deeply committed to maintaining a long-term upwards trajectory in trade and investment with India. Our bilateral relationship spans the full breadth from education to climate change, and the Australia-India Economic Cooperation Trade Agreement is testimony to that. ECTA presents significant opportunities for further growth in the economic relationship between both countries. It ensures Australian exports gain preferential access to one of the fastest growing major economies with remarkable demographics. 1.4 billion people, with a million turning 18 every month, and a forecasted 170 million households with disposable income greater than $50,000 by 2030. These are powerful drivers of high-end consumption and demand for products and services 
that Australian businesses can provide, including wine. Under ECTA, tariffs will be eliminated on more than 85% of Australian goods export to India, rising to almost 91% over 10 years. The Australian government is seeking to complete the processes to ratify the agreement as quickly as possible. ECTA also delivers some key outcomes for premium Australian wines. Currently, duties on Australian exports to India are 150%. Under the agreement, these duties will reduce to 50% over 10 years for bottles valued over $5 and reduce to 25% over the decade for bottles over $15. These reductions will make Australian wine more competitive relative to imports from other countries. Australia has also gained most favoured nation treatment on wine exports to India. This means that if the EU or any other free trade partner of India receives better market access for their wine in its free trade agreement, the benefits will also flow through to Australian producers. This paves the way for Indian consumers to enjoy a greater variety of Australian wine at more attractive prices. India has the world's third largest alcoholic beverages sector, valued at more than US $35 billion. However, wine isn't a traditional drink of choice for most Indian consumers. But wine consumption has grown steadily over the last two decades and is projected to grow by 8% per annum to 2024. Increased wine consumption in India reflects a change in demographics with India's young and increasingly wealthy population driving increased demand for refined, premium imported products. Wine consumption is becoming a symbol of wealth and status for India's growing middle class. In 2021, Australia was India's largest source of wine imports, with 43% share of the market valued at a record $12 million. Exports are also off to a record start this year. Reduced tariffs and established trade links means Australia is well placed to meet India's growing demand for premium wine. But remember, India is a continental market. It's a federation like us, and you need to go deeper than the headline figure of 1.4 billion people. To tap into the opportunities, our businesses need market entry strategies tailored by state and city. India is unlikely to be an overnight replacement for other large markets in the region. It will require long-term commitment, careful partner selection, an understanding of the business culture and often a local presence. And you need to build relationships. There's only so much that can be done remotely. Businesses aspiring to export to the Indian market and realise the benefits of ECTA need to be here. And happily, there's never been more direct flights. In conclusion, India will be a promising market for wine at the right price point and for businesses that are pragmatic, patient, persistent and passionate. I look forward to seeing you and your products in market here and I wish you every success in your endeavours. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Peter Bailey, Wine Australia's Manager, Market Insights. Peter has more than 15 years experience in providing analysis and insights for the Australian grape and wine sector. He'll provide an overview of India, a comparison with other major APEC nations, as well as insights on the latest export data for this market. But before we hear from Peter, let's play a video that provides a market overview of the three cities we're covering throughout this series, Delhi, Mumbai and Bangalore. India is a subcontinent and I always think it's a collection of myriad countries and cultures. Consumers are very largely divided, let's say I take 35 as an age group, so I'll take below 35 work a bit differently from above 35. So the older ones, yes, are more spirit oriented, the younger ones are more ferment oriented. The younger population of India has been born in an India of, of a fair amount of security, financial, political, and they've imbibed this wine culture already. 
women are definitely a part of it, if not the forerunners, the pioneers of it. In India, having shunned women for almost 150 years, the law was reversed to allow them to serve uh, liquor or even work behind bars. I think it's finally we've made a big turn. I feel this is a very important thing we all overlook. Women are key decision makers. Whether it comes to entertainment, whether it comes to decision making, whether it comes to gifting, women have a strong opinion and voice. They run homes. We have so many traditional families and setups, and uh, still in all of that, I think uh, holding a glass of wine has become much more acceptable. So how do people drink? Let's start from the north in Delhi. The people spend the most here. So maximum average spend per bottle may be highest in the north in Delhi. But awareness of what they're drinking may not be as high. Sure, there are pockets of people who know what they're drinking. They're discerned drinkers, connoisseurs as one might say, but they're fewer. More drinking here happens in a sort of this machismo, this bravado of showing off the most expensive wine on the bottle and having the ability to order it. Bombay, on the other hand, the financial capital of India is more astute. People will ask you a lot more questions, they're very poignant, very precise, they know what they're ordering, and at the end of it, they will spend, but maybe not as much as in Delhi. But on the whole, you'll find there's a better culture of drinking in Bombay for sure. Bangalore is more conscious of what they spend, but also remember Bangalore is right now a very young city again, because a lot of young people have come into work in the tech industry, and when they go out, they want a good experience, but not necessarily a pricey experience. And because the food is cheap, you always relate the price of your alcohol to your food. So the wine they order may not be as expensive, but they drink a fair amount. And remember, Bangalore and Bombay also, uh, from Maharashtra, make wine. So local wines also play a big role in this consumption pattern. In India, we believe in a life cycle of a million years. So 10 years, 20 years is not even a blink of an eye. So I think laws take time here to sort of distill down to being uh, in place. But if once they do, I think we do get it right. Uh, thank you. Uh, today I'll provide a brief overview of the Indian wine market, uh, starting with the size of the market, trends in the imported wine segment by price point, um, Australia's position in the market and trends in Australian exports to the country. Um, there is a lot of interest in India as a future wine market and this stems principally from its enormous population and uh, growing economy. More than one seventh of the world's population uh, now lives in India. Um, in 2021, the population was estimated to be 1.39 billion people and is set to overtake China as the world's largest population within 40 years. Compared to other countries, it has a low median age of 28.4 years and a small proportion of older people. This, coupled with rising life expectancy, um, has resulted in rapid population growth. India is also one of the largest and fastest growing economies in the world. Um, ranking number six behind the United Kingdom and ahead of France with an economy worth $2.7 trillion in 2020. Uh, like most economies, growth took a hit during 2020 and recovery in 2021 was hampered by another large outbreak of COVID-19 in the first half of the year. Um, Pre-pandemic economic performance is expected uh, to return in 2022. And importantly, for a luxury good like wine, um, the middle class is expected to grow to 380 million by 2030. Um, alcohol consumption in India is dominated by spirits and beer. Um, in 2020, Indians consumed 475 million cases of alcohol. Um, however, 58% of this volume was spirits and 41% with beer, and wine just made up 1% of the alcohol sales volume. While there are 485 million people above the legal drinking age of 25, um, the penetration of wine is very low at two to three million consumers. And according to the IWSR, India is the 10th biggest still wine market in the Asia Pacific region and 44th globally. And in 2021, um, there were 1.6 million cases of wine sold at a retail value of US $298 million. Uh, per capita wine consumption in India is very low, however, at less than half a litre per head. Um, to put this into perspective, um, Australians consume on average 20 litres per head per year. 
India also has a significant domestic wine industry, accounting for 51% of the wine market value and 66% of the volume. Uh, the high volume share um, indicates that domestic wines are at a lower end of the price spectrum. Uh, wine consumption is expected to grow in India thanks to a large and uh, rising middle class increasing urbanisation, an inclination towards imported wine, and a shift in consumer preferences from hard spirits um, to wine. Um, domestic still wine sales in India are pr practically all in the commercial value price segment at less than US $10 per bottle retail. Um, for imported wines, the split is 82% commercial value and 18% in premium and above, which is above US $10 per bottle retail. Um, between 2005 and 2019, um, the overall imported wine market grew by a compound average growth rate of 13% per annum, from US $25 million to US $135 million. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic saw the on-premise and many liquor stores being shut, which resulted in imported uh, wine sales falling by 24% in 2020. The market did rebound strongly in 2021, with imported wine sales up by 41%. Uh, and the IWSA has forecast imported wines to grow to US 200 million by 2026. Uh, this equates to a growth rate of 7% per annum over this period. Um, the growth rates do vary by price segment. Uh, commercial value sales are forced, forecast to grow by 5% per annum and the premium above sector to grow by 11% per annum over the same period, however, off a much uh, smaller base. And the high growth rate in premium above sales reflects the, that rising middle class and the growing awareness of wine as a category among Indian consumers. Um, Australia um, is well placed in India. Australian wine is clearly the number one imported still wine category with a 38% value share and 47% volume share. Uh, by value, Australia has three times the value and four times the volume of Chile, Italy and France. And Australia was the fastest growing category in the five years to 2019, with the value of sales growing by 29% per annum, compared to 14% for Italian wine, 7% for French, and 9% for Chilean wine. All imported wine ca categories declined during the pandemic impact of 2020. Um, Chile was the least impacted with sales value down 6%, um, and Australian wine sales declined by 16%, less than Italian wine, which was down 27%, and France by 24%. And as the market began to recover in 2021, um, Australia rebounded the strongest, up 51%, compared to Italian wines up 28%, and French and Chilean wines each up 38%. Uh, the IWSA has forecast similar growth rates out to 2026 for Australia, Chile, France, and Italy, each up around by 5 to 6% per annum over that period of time. Um, in 2021-22, India climbed into the top 20 destinations um, for Australian wine, ranking 17th by value and 19th by volume. Um, Australian wine ex exports grew almost threefold uh, to a record 19 million and 4.3 million litres. And the average value of exports increased by 1% to $4.43 per litre. Um, it is important to note that there are only 21 Australian companies exporting to India in 21-22 out of the 1,173 globally. Um, but that said, of the 21 companies who exported during the year, most of them contributed to the growth in value, but some more than others, depending on the size of the company. And red wine accounted for 73% of Australia's exports to India, with white wine at 22%. In most other destinations within Asia, with the exception of Japan, um, the share of red wine is much higher than that to India, and um, generally above 80%. Um, by the major price segments in the market, 96% of Australian sales are in the commercial value segment. Um, Australia dominates this segment with a 45% value share of imported wines, ahead of Chilean wines at 13%, Italian wines at 11%, and French wines at 10%. And Australia ranks fourth in the premium and above segment with an 8% value share behind France, Italy and New Zealand. Uh, the IWSR has forecast Australian sales in commercial value segment to grow by 5% per annum out to 2026, which is about the same as the French, Italian and Chilean wines. And the growth rate is forecast to be stronger for Australian wine in premium and above segment, um, with sales forecast to grow by 12% per annum. Uh, this is a similar rate for Chilean wines, but much higher than for Italian, French and New Zealand wines. 
Uh, looking at Australian exports to India by price segment, there was value growth in all segments. The $2.50 to $4.99 per litre segment is by far the major one, accounting for 86% of the total value of exports. Uh, the common customs tariff on wine imported to India is 150%, and a raft of other regulations also makes it difficult uh, market to navigate. Um, and the World Bank ranks India as number 62 in its ease of doing business index. In comparison, South Korea is ranked five and Japan at 30. And to provide further context, um, New Zealand and Singapore are ranked one and two respectively with Australia coming in at number 14 and our two biggest export markets of the US and UK at six and eight respectively. Um, however, in accordance with the uh, Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement, when it enters force, um, tariffs on Australian wine with a cost insurance and freight value of over $5 US per litre, uh, sorry, per bottle, uh, will decrease to 100% upon entry into force with a further phase reduction of 5% per year for 10 years down to 50%. Tariffs on Australian wine with a CIF value of over 15 US per bottle will decrease to 75% um, upon entry into force with a further phase reduction of 5% per year for 10 years down to 25%. Um, for Australian exporters, uh, US $5 per bottle roughly translates to Australian $8 per litre FOB and US 15 per bottle translates to Australian 26 per litre FOB. So this means that the tariff reductions will, in theory, equate to reduce retail prices for Australian premium wine exports to India. Uh, therefore, it's expected this will make India a more viable proposition for smaller to medium winemakers who have not previously contemplated entering the market. Currently, only 3% of exports to India at an average of Australian $8 per litre FOB or higher. Um, so that's probably where I'll leave it. Just to summarise the key takeaways, um, India is a long-term opportunity for Australian wine. Um, it's one of the world's fastest growing economies. It has a middle class expected to grow to $380 million by 2030. Um, wine is currently a niche category but is growing. Australia is well placed. It's the number one imported wine category and exports are growing strongly. Um, the market is dominated by commercial value wines, but premium is forecast to grow at a faster rate in the next five years. And the trade agreement will assist Australian growth um, in premium wines over the next decade. Thank you. So some really interesting insights there into the latest export data. So thanks so much to Peter Bailey for that. So now that we've got an understanding of where India sits in the APAC region, it's time for a deeper dive into this market. And with that, I'd like to invite Paneet Tomar, a senior consultant at Euromonitor International, to provide some consumer insights. With over 12 years of market research and consulting experience, Paneet is an Indian subcontinent specialist in the drinks and tobacco industry. But before we meet Paneet, let's listen to some Indian consumers. Bangalore is beer capital of the country. Bangalore alone has 70 microbreweries. Against about 110, we have microbreweries all over India. Bangalore consumer likes innovation. I think I'd prefer wine because wine is something that I can combine with like having dinner. Then this is obviously now because we're older. Like when we were younger, you'd prefer other kinds of alcohol. So yeah, it's either wine or gin and sometimes beer. I prefer a red and I prefer something that's not very sweet and maybe something a bit dry. I think we all started off going uh, clubbing and then you have your vodka, your uh, gins, your tequilas and then you come back with a bad hangover. And that's why now we've sobered down to having wine because you can wake up the next day, go back to work. Uh, it still gives you a nice uh, palate to your meals when you're having like a nice sit down dinner. I don't think we're aware of any brand which has got an Australian uh, origin. I'm a fan of tequila and wine. I like both red and white. So Shiraz and Chardonnay. I think Indian wines now are at par with the Italian 
wines. You will find that if you have a party, you would have 60% to 70% people going for hard liquor, for spirits. There will be the younger lot, the 40% that go for wines, and then there will be a senior lot who have been advised by the doctor to cut back on their drinking, who have now switched to wines for a healthier lifestyle. Rosé gives me the balance of the red and the white. Red, I don't like at all. It kind of tans my uh, tongue a lot. Once a week, typically weekend. Typically weekend binge. Jacobs is what we've all grown up as. That's been the basic, standard, baseline whites. I would relate Australian wines to more being whites. I'm not divided between choosing a red or a white unless it's a good wine. Uh, I don't have a preferred country of wine, though Napa happens to be the best, my favorites in most of the cases. Always imported. Indian wines suck, sorry. Uh, I mean, I'm being very honest. I, Indian wines are just not worth it. They are, they're dry, they're, most of the time sour. You will see at these lavish weddings, people uh, serve the best of whiskey and single malts. But when you ask them what wine you're serving, it's a white or a red. Like they, they don't really focus on what kind of wine uh, you know, they are serving. It is changing slowly but surely. But, uh, but yes, I think a lot can be done with education per se in Delhi. People ask for wine and they ask me to suggest wine for them because they don't know about the wine. I don't want them to try the very heavy body like uh, Shiraz and all because uh, they won't like it. They will find that it's very like uh, bitter and all. So I'll make them try some good whites like uh, Chardonnay's, Rieslings um, and some Rosés. So they will get the flavour of a uh, little bit of sweetness. In terms of liquor, definitely hard liquor. I'm, I'm more of a whiskey drinker. And maybe casually, sometimes beer or a glass of wine. Occasionally, maybe in a party or some of some celebrations, then we go for a glass of wine or some beer. And definitely on the summer season, uh, maybe a bottle of beer. I prefer red wine as opposed to white or, or rosé. I think with with Merlot is too heavy with Indian food. I find with Indian food is too much masala and then having a melo after that it, it just like gets heavy. I don't drink wine every day because uh, I'm eating all kinds of food and with, in India sometimes it's too hot. A lot of wine I think that comes from out of India. The problem is I've seen it in stores where they put it outside in the show window. It's hot. How are you doing that? That's going to kill the wine. We understood what kind of styles of wine people like. We also understood that why people like the Cabernets and Shirazes of the world. They also like grape varieties like Malbec. Now I think Malbec is extremely popular here. And if you go to see, you understand why it is. It's a big voluptuous wine, uh, lower tannin structure compared to some of the other grape varieties. And so it's immediately likable to a lot of people who may be relatively new to wine as well. Indian consumers are extremely price sensitive because the incidence of duties is almost the highest in the world. What we import at maybe a dollar, finally the maximum retail price for that bottle is $10. So it's a 10 is to 1 ratio. Keeping that in mind, Indian consumers tend to buy wines at below 2 to 2.5 thousand rupees a bottle. And 80 to 85 percent of the market is in that category. Good morning, everyone. My name is Puneet Tomar, and I am a senior consultant in Euromonitor Bangalore office. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to present about the wine consumption trends for the India market. Before I start into the market details, I'd like to uh, talk a bit about Euromonitor. So Euromonitor is a leading independent market research provider, and we support a client decision making on how, where, and where to grow their business. Headquartered in London, we have 16 offices across the globe. Uh, we conduct research for around 30 FMCG industries across uh, 100 geographies. Apart from that, we also provide demographic, macroeconomic, and social economic data for more than 210 uh, countries. Uh, in in this slide, you will see uh, you know what all what all different uh, a, a quick snapshot of a coverage of industries, economic data, and consumer trends. M moving on, uh, I would like to you know set the agenda that what exactly we would be dis discussing the agenda of the presentation will center on the wine market in india we'll first 
look into the wine category and how it is placed when looking at the overall Indian alcoholic drink market. Post that, we would analyze the imported wine volumes followed by the key players in the industry. Uh, after looking into all of these, we'll, uh, we'll also talk about you know, what, all in, what all this information means for Australian wine exporters. So without wasting any time, I'll, I'll start talking about the Indian market. So as of 2021, the total wine consumption in India stood at approximately 34.6 million litres with off trade sales accounting for 81.6% volume sales while the remaining was through the on trade sales. Uh, if I have to talk about the consumption growth, the wine consumption witnessed uh, a with wine consumption witnessed a 3.2% CAGR over the 2018-2021 period. Uh, the low growth was primarily due to the volume decline in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic, the rise in disposable incomes, rapid urbanization, and perceived health benefits of consuming alcoholic beverages with lower alcohol content had led to a significant increase in wine consumption. We believe that this trend is expected to continue in the future as well. Uh, now, India lacks a uniform taxation system. In addition, most states' products are taxed at the overall volume rather than ABV, which is alcohol by volume, which affects wine competitive affordability to other categories. Some of the on-trade regulations are even more challenging. On-trade sales are affected by typical rules like in Delhi, where wine and beer purchased by restaurants must be consumed within three days or disposed of or the need to obtain more than 12 different licenses, including one to play music in Bangalore. These regulations make running an on-trade establishment a costly and complicated affair, which translates into high prices for wine in these establishments. Having talked about the market, I would like to touch uh, about how big the, is wine when compared to the overall alcoholic drinks uh, segment. So in India, Spirits led by whiskies dominate the alcoholic drink market, followed by beer. Wine, on the other hand, account for less than a percent volume share as of 20, 2021 of the total 5 billion liters of alcoholic drinks consumption. Despite low per capita consumption level for wine compared to APAC or globally, the growth potential of wine is is pretty high. This is primarily due to more due to uh, you know approximately a billion people in the above the age group of 18. Uh, having discussed, I'll 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 talk more about the imports. You know, so uh, if we have to talk about imports, so as of 2021, Australia accounted for 47.5 percent of the total imported wine in volume terms. Uh, which increased from 27.2% in 2017. Australia is primed to consolidate its position as the top importer on the back of the recent trade agreement. Just to throw num some numbers, Australia witnessed 46% volume growth uh, when we look at January to May 2022 over the same period last year. At the same time, the total imported wine to India remains on a higher side at 44%. Now, talking about the popular Australian brands in the Indian market, Jacobs Creek, DeBotley, and McWilliams are among the most important brands from Australia that have gained popularity in India. One uh, another key point which I'd like to add is due to the recent trade agreement, there would be tariff reductions which would reduce the taxes, taxes paid on imports on, on, of Australian wine to India, the reductions will improve the competitiveness of Australian wine relative to imports from Chile, France, and Italy. Summon Soma Wines is the leading player in the Indian wine market. Over the last two decades, Summon Soma Wine has cons consistently added to its wine portfolio products made from 15, 15 different varieties of grapes. This allows the company to cater to all consumer segments. Owing to its success, the company is also planning to file an IPO in 2022. Historically, the company has not shied away from 
inorganic growth with its acquisition of Heritage Winery in 2017, and then again its acquisition of York Winery in 2021. Apart from this, wine tourism has has been another focus for the company to market its product. For example, in 2022, the company has hosted 250,000 people in its wine yard for wine tasting. Moving on, Grover Zampa is the second largest player in the market um, and it primarily focus on the premium segment. The company is specifically looking to spend resources to market and distribute its products in smaller cities. The major challenge of targeting consumer in smaller towns is the stigmas associated with drinking, especially in the case of women. So to overcome this challenge, Grover Zampa experimented with some earlier at home program before the pandemic to, to address this issue. What the company did was the company conducted tasting sessions in the home of interested consumers by offering a variety of wine and cheese. Now, having talked about the local players, I'll also like to touch about uh, the imported brands, which which falls under the others category, a segment which is highly fragmented. So just to uh, in the others category, Jacob, when I have to talk about the imported players, Jacob, uh, Jacob Creek uh, is the fourth largest brand in the still light grape category. Uh, and just to give you some insight, the still light grape category account for close to 57% of the total wine consumption in India. So, uh, and uh, to talk about why Jacob Keek is popular, it's primarily due to its affordable pricing, which, which, uh, which is quite popular among the middle class consumers. Moving on, look, what does all of this mean? You know, I, I like to summarize what are the key takeaways. So in India, consumer prefer wine primarily due to its perceived health benefits and lower all alcohol content. So apart from targeting key cities such as Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai and Hyderabad, uh, we are seeing that the rise of the middle class consumers and there's an increasing consumption which is happening in the tier two and tier three cities. All of this present opportunities for wine importers uh, sorry, wine exporters to the Indian market. Now, I'll also like to talk about the channel. In terms of channel, retail channel accounts for majority of the sales. However, when it comes to premium imported wine, uh, uh, premium imported wine, food service is one of the key channel. Finally, uh, I would say that complex taxation pol uh, uh, policies might impact the overall distribution and availability of wine across the country along with high prices when compared to other alcoholic drinks is something you know which is hindering which might uh, hinder the market growth and with this i come to an end thank you so much Thank you so much, Paneet. Now, if you have questions, um, start getting them in because there will be a uh, live Q&A session at the end. Uh, to join the conversation, you can post directly into the chat. To ask a question, simply click on the Add to Q&A button. So get those questions in. Uh, now, I'd not now like to introduce Margandeep Singh, or Margan as he prefers to be called. Uh, he's a journalist, sommelier, and author of two award-winning books on the Indian beverage market market. Now, Margan has provided a downloadable PDF for reference during this presentation. So thanks for that, Margan. Hi, everybody. Uh, this today will be a, a sort of a deep dive, but in shallow waters about how to enter and explore the Indian market. So this is really useful if you're a wine uh, producer or a, uh, a conglomerate or an, or, or an aggregator and you wish to understand the Indian market, how it works, this should be, this should be fairly comprehensive. So first of all, um, always remember, and I always start with this, that India is a land of a million gods. We believe, believe in a life cycle of a million years. So a year or two is not even a blink of an eye. So don't be disheartened if things don't happen right up front. It takes time in India, be patient. And uh, so where do you start? You first start off with getting a list of reliable importers, not just importers, but reliable ones. How do you check they're reliable? If someone approaches you, you ask them two questions. 
what hotels or restaurants are they currently supplying to what brands are they representing officially if anybody answers those two questions satisfactorily they are mostly reliable there are about a handful a dozen reliable importers in india there are about a 50 60 other importers and maybe a few hundred more who will import just about anything the risk is that when you import alcohol it requires very special uh, laws and regulations to to abide by so if you're not a seasoned uh, all through and through alcohol importer you may run into trouble so first of all you have to you have to identify the importer you can go through various means to get there uh, whether a hotel, there's no point approaching hotels and customers directly because unless the wine or the beverage is available in india through an importer it cannot reach any hotel any restaurant any retail shop so you can do events with consumers uh, you'll have a great turnout people will love the wine but it is useless because unless you have an importer it all comes to naught uh, so you start with an importer you find them you ask them the two questions you get satisfactory answers you move to the next step which is you zero in on the labels you wish to bring in remember india has high taxes uh, I'm making this presentation on the cusp of the FTA being signed, which means once the free trade agreement is in place, Australian wines stand to become much cheaper. I'll give you the breakup later of what might get affected. But in the meantime, remember that it's an expensive product. So you have to make sure that whatever starts in Australia pre FTA would have ended up 10 times on an Indian retail shop. So if you start at $1, it's going to be about 10 Australian dollars by the time it reaches the shops, maybe even higher. In fact, cheaper products become sometimes more expensive. So you have to, you can't get the high end wines in. And there are other reasons why I will deter you from doing that in the beginning. So you zero in on the samples, look at things between uh, two to $5 in the pre FTA era maybe eight to ten once this lifts um, and once you've done that you will negotiate with the importer you will decide in various things you have to figure out what costs are you taking care of what costs are being put on to them very often importers will ask you to remove the marketing budget because it reduces the cost of the wine the you know the cost or the carry the cif price and that helps them keep the duties low and but for their turn they will generate that marketing budget at their end in india but you have to get them to commit to it so that you know there are events happening. And remember, education and awareness is the best spend you will ever do in India. You can do it all in English. There is no translation required, no Hindi, no regional languages. Don't listen to all of that. Always keep it in English, simple English, communicate in English and make sure you do it frequently and constantly so that you, so you need to have that marketing budget at hand. Once you've discussed everything, then you sort of start discussing how to bring the wines in. And the first thing that the importer will tell you is they need special back labels. So the Food Safety Standards Authority of India set out some terms and conditions on how things can come into India. And one of them is the back label has to be for India, which requires it to have, amongst other things, the list of ingredients uh, and the address, phone number, email for your importer. And that makes it crucial that you need to be on the same page. You need to have a minimum order quantity which you can satisfy for such an order. Otherwise, again, there's trouble. So this is the FSSAI, the Food Safety Standards Authority of India. You have to meet all the regulations, comply with them. And then remember, the real pain is not that one-time compliance for the back label. Each time a shipment comes in, two bottles of every label have to be submitted for analysis and you have to pay some fee i think it's about 80 australian dollars maybe no sorry sorry it's about 100 to 150 australian dollars per label and that's each shipment so it's not once a year it's every time you send stuff in two bottles of each label so there's a white and a red and a rosé two bottles of each will be submitted for analysis if the first bottle satisfies then the second one will be sent back to in about 15 days but you have to pay the fee per bottle Oh, sorry per label and that's that's done that's your clearance from fssci it is important to have this because once you have this is only when you can clear your goods from the customs and bring them in without this it won't work so and and one big thing i sort of skipped skipped on so far is the fact that in india alcohol is not a uh, an, a federal subject it's a state subject so think of it as india being 30 states there are almost 30 different countries every state can make their own laws on alcohol and that's where things get really complicated for for ease of work we will work with delhi and bombay as the first two markets we focus on because that's where the majority of the business is focused so delhi bombay and then subsequently maybe goa and bangalore those are the, well, their cities but they're in respective states delhi is a state by itself bombay is in maharashtra bangalore is in karnataka and goa is again a state by itself so you you'll need to decide where you wish to go first so you've decided the wines the importer 
you've got the back labels done, FSA is all lined up for when the shipment comes. Now you have to decide which state you begin with. And at this point, I have a little visual that I'd like to share with all of you, and you'll see it on your screens. It can, it can also be shared with you. And this visual sort of gives you a, a rough sketch or a rough, and it's, it's, it's fairly, I mean, correct in terms of the flow, but the, the amounts might change, the numbers might change a bit here and there. So CIF, you've got your price and your label registration is done and it reaches India. When it reaches India, it's technically a part of the, the nation of India, the national level. It's not there at the state level. So now you decide I want to go into Delhi, for example. So you will have to register the labels in Delhi. Now, label registration is a thing that's common across states. The only difference being that some states charge an arm and a leg for it, like Delhi at the moment, and some states have it almost pro rata, like Bombay at the moment. So what it means is you have to, as an official importer, have a, have a letter from the winery, from your principal saying that you are the official importer, and then you go and show this and register the brand, and it gives you the rights to sell that wine for one financial year in that state. Now, remember that the policy is supposed to come out in April. It never does. I'm sitting here in Delhi in, in, in August and the policy is still not out. So it always gets delayed. So whenever policy the policy comes out is when you pay your label registration fee for that year and you register the labels, which says these are allowed to be sold in the state. This is apart from the FSSAI. So you got in the goods, you had your FSSAI registration, which is needed to clear them from the customs levels, you have it ready with you, but you also have to register the label in every state where you wish to be present. <clears throat> so now that's done, you've registered the labels. There's also a fee involved there. As I told you, in Bombay it's pro rata, so you pay as you go, which is fabulous. In Delhi, it's um, in rupees right now, it's about 100,000 rupees per wine label, divide by 55 at the moment to get the Australian equivalent, so roughly $2,000 Australian per label just to have the rights to sell for one year. So now you understand you cannot bring allocation wines because if you have a bottle that you only want to sell 50 of, you still have to pay these $2,000 and amortizing that cost will be a tough play. So you've got the goods now, you've got the re label registered, now you enter Delhi. So the first thing is now they will, they will charge you customs. So this was, although you could have paid customs and still waited to get it to Delhi, I'm sort of explaining that as the goods land, you pay your customs, which is paid on the CIF plus 1%, which is called the accessible value. This number stands at 150%. And this is the number that stands to come down as part of the FTA. The free trade agreement will allow you to lower the customs implication of the, of the total duties and taxes component that wines are subject to. So this 150%, I think, if I'm not, if not, if I'm not mistaken, it's broken down as... 50% is customs and 100% is some agricultural cess or something else uh, or education cess. I don't know. They've tried to break it up recently by that by that logic, but effectively you have 150% of customs in the FTA. This will come down significantly over the next 10 years, only for wines over $5. I think you know the rest, but that's the customs bit. That's paid at the central level or the national level. So you've entered the goods into India. You've paid the customs duty. Now you take your label registration, your FSA certificates, you go to Delhi government and say, here I am, and I want to sell this. Before that, obviously, the importer will now add his or her margin. And I'm saying 30 to 50%. I'm being very conservative about this. People might add up to 100%. And it's not because they're being greedy. It's because to account or accommodate the marketing budget that you may have let off earlier, one thing. And now you can see how it helps because it comes after the customs. So you've saved it. If you had added $1 in Australia, you would have been 150% duty on it. Adding the $1 at this point now will make it significantly cheaper. But that's what importers might often do. You can advise them to work that way, but always get the commitment in writing as to how many events they will do. So they have their margin. It can go up to 100% also. You will have to negotiate and figure out and understand what they're doing with it. And now you are ready to sell. Uh, mind you, the importer's margin also includes um, other giveaways. If they have to create POS material as, and you know, gifts, uh, things like that for the distributor or the retailer, it comes from their margin. Now comes the excise component. Excise is a tax that is levied by the states. Okay, so every state has their own excise policy. The excise policy says you have to register the label for 2000 Australian dollars and then pay almost 65% as an excise tax. So, whereas in Bombay, it's based on the bottle price and it's, uh, it's based on the bottle, sorry, it's a fixed amount of 225 rupees or if it's above 6,000, it's 5%. Either which ways, Bombay is definitely smarter in, in this regard. Having said that, 
in India, you uh, sorry in India, every state has their own way of working with it. Uh, the way the, the the distribution works. So Delhi also managed to get high volumes in spite of the vent fee because it's uniform and everybody's paying the same. So you pay the sixty five percent, and now you have the distributor, and finally the distributor of the state will give it to the retailers, the restaurants, and so on and so forth. This is general flow. Very often an importer may also be the distributor. And in some cases, they might even have retail shops, in which case they can sort of unify their margin at one point to make it relatively cheaper for themselves, but it's it, it, it's their prerogative. Having said that, there's a 20, I think it's 25% now, the VAT in Delhi. Uh, so you have that to pay, which is collected from the consumer. So just to let you know your wine, and if you're wondering why a $1 wine ends up for almost $10, maybe even higher, it's because of all these duties and taxes along the way. Duties for for nomenclature purposes is always at the, are, are always at the central level. Taxes are at the state level. So if I ever say customs duty, that's at the central level. That's for the state and the, the, the nation. If I say excise tax, it's for the state that I'm getting into. Conversely, if you look at Bombay right next to it, obviously it's much cheaper because you don't have the same registration fee to pay. It's a very nominal per bottle fee they have. I think it's one rupee or even lesser than that. And that makes it extremely affordable to bring wine into Bombay. And then you obviously have a lowered excise tax. So effectively, it's much cheaper to move wines there. Having said that, there have been new rules last in the last few years in Delhi. So at the moment, our excise policy is a bit up in the air. Uh, but what I can tell you is Delhi has been selling significantly cheaper than Bombay because what the government did was they collected the excise component up front. So they went to shops and said, we know how much you paid us last year. So based on that, pay us, this, pay us the same amount this year and you have all the stocks and you can sell as much as you want. And what did the retail shops in Delhi do? They started discounting by 40 to 50 percent to bring in the crowds. Effectively, Delhi was selling cheaper than other states. I mean, it was I think, the second or third cheapest state in the country. They didn't make any money, which is why the policy is being debated right now. This is July 2022 and we're still debating it. It's supposed to come out. We don't know what will come of it. So it's a bit of a mess, but yes, Delhi was ex ex exceptionally cheap. The only problem was we didn't have too much variety because the registration fee remained 2000 Australian dollars per bottle label, and that didn't come down. So the variety is limited. Mumbai, on the other hand, is variety and a fairly decent price. So this sort of at a glance is how things work. When things reach a hotel, um, remember that they will price it almost two or three times higher which will further inflate the price and make it sound even more unaffordable. Retailers have a fixed margin by the state in Delhi. It's called the MRP, the maximum retail price. Delhi used to use this concept. Bombay, Gurgaon, many other states do not, which means the retailer decides how much margin to hold back and what to sell it at. It makes the market more competitive and maybe good for the consumer. So all in all, you've got all these channels to get in. And as I said, it all starts with the importer. So if you do not have an importer in place, it will not work out and uh, and so always get the importer talk to them spend all your time you know it's the abe lincoln saying that if i have to chop down a tree in 12 hours i'm gonna you know uh, sharpen my axe for the first 10 well 11 that's this one so spend all the time identifying the right importer make sure there are what other brands they have there's no concurrence there's nothing else that competes with yours nothing will cannibalize your lot versus or, or vice versa and that you're fairly unique on that list and, and, and beyond that, always try and carve out your niche and educate and make people aware. So spend a lot on that consistently and that will help you establish the market much better. So that in a relatively large nutshell is how to send wine to India and have it land up in Indian hotels, restaurants and retail. Hope that helps. I'm sure that does help. Um, some really handy practical information about considerations uh, in terms of exporting to India. So thank you, Margan. Uh, now we've only got a short time to cover your questions, but if you are able to, please stay online and we'll bring you the poll results a little bit later on as well. So hang in for those as well. Um, we want you to continue to contribute and listen to the discussion. So keep putting the questions into that Q&A um, function. We have Peter, Paneet and Margan available to answer any of your questions live uh, for the next few minutes or so. So please, when you're doing this, just indicate who you would like to direct your question to. It makes it flow a little bit more easily. 
So, yes, we have a few up here. And the first one is for you, Margan. Are screw caps or corks preferred for this market? I'm very happy to say that we are closure agnostic. Luckily in India, you can have an expensive wine in screw cap and you can have it in cork and the consumer will not really judge you for it. So that sort of works out for Australia. But having said that, if you go super premium, people will prefer corks. Okay, so uh, that was short and sweet, thank you. Uh, Paneet, which Indian states have the most growth potential for wine exports, do you think? Uh, so for uh, uh, wine exports, uh, uh, Maharashtra and Karnataka are the, uh, would be the, the leading states where, ex where the exporters can look to explore opportunities. Apart from that, Delhi is another region, uh, you know, where the exporters can focus on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and this one is for Peter. Is India a long play or do you think it's worth getting into the market now? It is a long play, most definitely, but I think, yeah, um, doing all the research now and setting yourself up now is, um, is important. Yep. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Peter. So, um, sorry, the, the, the questions are just rolling up um, as, as we're going, so keep them coming in. So, Margan, what do Indian consumers think about Australian wine compared to wine from other countries? What do they actually think about it, do you think? Well, for the longest time, Australia was considered one unified wine region. So if someone had an Australian wine on their list or in their cellar, they thought that was it. It's taken them some time to realize it is practically a continent unto itself and you have so many sub-regions and they've only just begun exploring. So for the longest time, and please remember, Jacobs Creek outsells every other imported wine, not just Australian, at a ratio of one is to one. So a lot of people think Australian wine is good, fun, entry-level stuff. So they're just only learning to explore sub-regions. They're learning names like Barossa and Hunter Valley and, and so on. Uh, and, and it'll take a while before they understand how they're all different. Mm. And, you know, interestingly, what sort of wines, I mean, you know the market really well, what sort of wines go best <laughs> with Indian food? You know, um, Indian food is very complicated. There are 30 states and we can never agree on which cuisine is better or and they're completely different. So depending on where you're eating, you can have, I mean, remember India in the north is, is wheat based, so it's bread based. And then from the south, it's rice based. And what begins in India as a rice belt continues all over Southeast Asia, this all rice. And north of India towards Europe is all bread. So India is a cusp of bread eaters and rice eaters. So just that is a big division. And then food's spicy in the south, it's richer in the north, it's, clim it's climatically, uh, it's religiously, it's, it's influenced by many things. So there's never going to be one wine that goes with it. And I think that's a fabulous thing, which means there's space for everyone to be accommodated. Yeah, sounds like great opportunities there in that case. Um, so this question is for Peter. What will be the tax on wine priced less than five Australian dollars? That will still remain at 150%. It won't change. That's not covered by the trade agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Straight answer. Uh, and Margan again, is the tax system the same for spirits like whiskey or vodka? The taxation for all foreign products might be more or less similar, but beer is different. The biggest difference, however, happens between domestic and imported and between whiskey, or spirits and ferments. So, and, and, and mainly in the registration part. So the registration fee in Delhi, for example, changes significantly. And then the taxation change, the, the state level taxes can often change depending on which state you are. But 150% for import remains fairly uniform. That's customs duty, the taxes change. Okay, and we've actually got a follow up question to that actually. It's why isn't wine a popular beverage in India? Why, we heard in some of those packages how people are drinking spirits and beer, <coughs> but why not wine? And which are, which are the top red Value and white money. varieties as well as part of that? Four friends get together, they want a good high, getting a bottle of whiskey is going to be much cheaper or a 
brick of pints versus getting a bottle of a good wine. So it's just value for money. Remember, India is one of the oldest civilizations. They have a fairly extensively developed palate. We have 30 cuisines. We fight about which butter chicken or chicken tikka masala is the best in our region. So clearly they're developed palates. The only problem is accessibility is very limited. It's so expensive to get wine, which is why you will find more people opt for spirits and beers. Taxes coming down, duties coming down will make a significant difference to the way we drink. Yeah, it sounds like a time of real opportunity in that case. Um, look, thank you. We're, we're nearing the end of the presentation because we want to wrap up. You know, we wanted to keep to an hour. So on behalf, behalf of Austrade and Wine Australia, we'd like to thank our presenters, uh, Peter Bailey, Panit Tomar from Euromonitor and Margan Singh. And now I can report on the results of our poll that you uh, entered earlier in this webinar. So they are... So 4% of you have exported to India in the past. 19% are currently exporting to India or will in the next year. It's quite a sizable number. 58% are considering exporting to India in the next five years. 19 are still unsure about the market and want to learn more. And that's what these sessions are all about. Um, so today's session has been recorded and we will email you a link when it's live on our website. Thank you again for joining our first Market Ready India briefing. Uh, we hope to see you again next Wednesday to provide you with a deeper understanding of what AI ECTA means for Australian producers. And there'll also be information about the regulatory environment, as well as logistical and freight considerations for exporting to this market. So I'll see you then. <laughs>